day. Um, today we're here to, he here to listen to Dr. Zarai Alemsneged uh, speak to us. He's the curator and Irvine chair of the Department of Anthropology at the California Academy of Sciences. And Zarai began his career by earning his Bachelor of Science in Geology from Addis Ab Ababa University. And then he continued his studies in France, where in addition to learning about paleo and paleontology and paleoanthropology, Zarai also had to um, start learning French to go on to complete his dissertation written in French in 1998. Um, at the University of Paris 6 and the Nas National Museum of Natural History. Zarai's dissertation focused on a side branch of, er of the early human family, the transition from the large molared um, species Australopithecus aethiopicus to Australopithecus boisei. And in this work, um, Zarai uh, emphasized the paleo-environmental context of this transition and he's carried this emphasis um, to his current work, um, his current research. During his time as a PhD student, Zarai was a member of Donald Johansson and Bill Kimball's paleoanthropological field project at Hadar in the Afar region of Ethiopia. After completing his dissertation research, Zarai struck out on his own and founded the Dikika Research Project um, in the Dikika region of the Af Afar. And this region has pr proven to be very rich, and Zarai has continued to work in this region and the Asbole, the nearby Asbole, for the past um, 10 years. And so it was in Dikika in 2000 that Zarai discovered the 3.3 million year old um, <coughs> skeleton of a three year old child. Um, a child, a juvenile skeleton of the same species as the Lucy fossil. And after years of painstaking um, preparation of this fossil, um, the discovery was announced in Nature in 2006. And the completeness and age at death of this fossil um, provides, promises to provide many unique insights into early human evolution. And many of these insights Sarai is going to share with us um, this afternoon. So before moving to the California Academy of Sciences about one year ago, Zarai was a research associate at the um, French Center for Ethiopian Opian Studies at Addis Ababa, a postdoctoral research associate at the Institute for Human Origins in, at Arizona State University in Tempe. And then he also spent four years as a senior researcher at the Department of Human Evolution at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. However, we're very pleased now that uh, Zarai has joined the paleoanthropological community of Northern California, and we're even more pleased to have him here to present on his work um, today. So please join me in welcoming Zarai um, to UC Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Theresa. Sorry about that. <coughs> Gee. Well, I'm as primitive as the bones that I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> so, good afternoon. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I would like to start by thanking the uh, organizers of the Stroller Lecture Series. I really feel very honored and privileged to be here in front of you. And I also thank everybody for coming today. And I'll try to make sure that I do justice to your time and your patience. Uh, <coughs> because this is a series on big questions, uh, and biological questions, I'll try to speak about the big questions, but at the same time give you illustrations of how the small findings can address uh, the big questions that we are interested in. Uh, <coughs> among the big questions that we anthropologists and in general evolutionary biologists are interested in 
uh, are the questions what makes us human and are defining our place and role in nature. Uh, but as you all know, these questions are uh, as old as humanity itself. Humanity has been curious about these questions since it became conscious about its very existence. And yet, uh, these issues are heavily debated and explored actively up until today and uh, encountered very regularly in top scientific journals, including uh, uh, Nature and others, and also the mainstream media. So uh, it was in 1871 that Charles Darwin predicted that our earliest origins would be found somewhere in Africa. And he suggested that based on the observations that he made on the physical similarities between great apes, African great apes, and humans. He then did not have the genetic or fossil evidence to substantiate, support his views. So what I'm trying, today, trying to do today is to show you how, based on the discovery of fossils, which is one way of looking at these big issues, how we can substantiate Darwin's predictions, and by way of doing so, tell you a little bit about my work and basically walk you through the uh, very uh, exciting work that uh, I undertake. <coughs> so I said uh, we are closely related to the African apes, and we say that because when you do genetic analysis of extant humans and the chimpanzees, you see that an overwhelming amount of over 98% of the same genetic material is shared between this and this species. And that would mean, of course, that we shared a common ancestor sometime around six to seven million years ago. So when you are a paleoanthropologist like myself, what you're trying to do is trying to fill in this gap by finding the hard evidence, the fossil evidence, so that we can talk about the different stages of development through time in terms of anatomy, behavior, and other attributes that define us as a species, but also as a genus or a family. So when I say hominins or hominids, I'm talking about this branch. All subsequent species after the split from the chimpanzees. Of course, the chimpanzees have evolved their own way. Oops. They have evolved their own way, but what I'm calling hominins is this branch. So the question is, when you find a fossil, even though you know a common ancestor existed sometime around seven million years ago, and even though you know we are very closely related with the chimpanzees, what are the attributes that we are trying to look at so that we can explore the relationship that we have with other extant species, but also among the many species that we find? Of course, the most obvious is the anatomy of the skull and the rest of the skeleton. It's by examining the, the anatomy, the morphology, which can be defined in a simpler way, shape and size, that we are able to tell how the face or the skull changed over time, how the skeleton changed over time. And we learn that indeed brain expands over time after we split from the chimpanzees from about 350 all the way to 1400. And also the face becomes shorter and smaller over time. And of course, changes also occur in the lower part of the skeleton, the postcrania. And it's by documenting these types of anatomical changes over time that we know there are, there are things, there are indeed, uh, things are indeed changing over time. So one important big question for us is understanding the anatomy and how it changed over time. Second is the locomotor repertoire, or the mode of locomotion employed by the different species over time. We know that sometime around six to seven million years ago, we started to become upright walking, and that's what, what distinguishes us from the rest of apes. But that type of locomotion has gradually evolved over time, and the runners that we are today did not come until much later in time. So when we try to address big issues, the second big issue is locomotion, the way we roam the landscape. Third, of course, the behavior, be it in its form, primitive form, or instinct animal form, or this very modern way of communicating that we have today, that combined can give you a behavior. 
And the behavior is described, of course, the interaction between males and the females in terms of, say, sexual dimorphism, infants and parents. What do we know about the very species that have existed over the past six to seven million years ago? So in addition to anatomy and locomotion, behavior is the other important big issue. And of course, culture. Because we know sometime 2.6 million years ago, our ancestors started to make and use stone tools. That is a major shift in your behavior because you start to interact with your environment differently. You have now something in between you and nature and that transforms everything. And the many complicated computers and machines and rockets that we have today are nothing but in my view an extension and sophistication in time of this primitive stone tool uh, created 2.6 million years ago. And I wouldn't be surprised if we found something older than 2.6 million years ago, but that is what we have today. So it's by exploring, by exploring the issues of anatomy, locomotion, behavior, and culture that we are trying to explain the evolutionary history of our family, which ended up in Homo sapiens that we are today. So if you look at any aspect of any paleoanthropologist's work, what he does or she does is a subset or part of these big issues. And when you actually look at the fossils, they, 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 they speak to you very easily when, when you have a minimum of training, of course. And if you looked at this skeleton, which is a composite skeleton of a species that has existed over three million years ago, look at the head, which is this one, is very chimpanzee-like. Look at the pelvis, which is this one, it's human-like. And when you look at the palate, however, it's intermediate between humans and chimpanzees. And the canine is also intermediate between humans and chimpanzees. What is this telling us? It's telling us that things are changing slowly and progressively, or there was no jump. And documenting this, this looks like a simplistic one, but this is what's happening in nature, actually. And because we have access to this hard evidence, the fossil evidence, we paleoanthropologists are privileged to talk not only about what makes us human, but also what made us human over time. And that makes us, in a way, uh, different. So given those big questions, given our approach, when we go actually find the bones, how do we know whether a given species or a given bone belongs to a hominin or not? There are criteria. And one of them particularly when you speak about the very first hominins just after the split from the chimpanzees is bipedalism or upright walking. If you can establish that a given species belongs to an upright walking creature, then you have a hominin. That's our paradigm anyway. But of course, Henry will tell you that is not a very easy thing to do. It's very complicated. But one, criteria, one criterion is to show that indeed bipedalism exists, one. And second, you have to demonstrate that that species has gone away from the chimp or ape model in terms of social structure. How can you speak about social structure in fossils that are over four million years ago, uh, over four million years old? Well, you could. If you looked here, this is a chimpanzee and you have interlocking canines because sexual dimorphism in this species is very high. There is a high competition, male-male competition. Whereas in humans, we don't have any interlocking canines. So the expectation is that if you can show there is indeed hunting complex, it's called, the premolar and the canine interlocking, if you can demonstrate, then you have an ape. If you can demonstrate a shift from that, then you can say the behavior was becoming more human. That's how we try to identify the very first hominins. 
when you start to do that, however, it's not easy because the fossils are so fragmentary and you don't find those features always or those skeletal elements that are relevant to those issues. Based on that, those criteria, we now know today among the earliest hominins is Sahelanthropus chadensis, a fossil which actually is more important for its, from the paleobiogeographic point of view. Up until 2000, all the fossils came from East Africa. But when this, this discovery was, was made in Chad, it was uh, unheard of because it meant that the East Side story was wrong in a way. In other words, evolution, hominin evolution was taking place at a continent level and it was not restricted to East Africa. So that was the major contribution of this fossil. But in addition, this author say that because the foramen magnum, which is the hole at the base of your skull, is anteriorly placed, it was holding its skull upright. So it was working upright. And also, they saw evidence of a non-honing or a slightly honing complex in the tooth. It's based on this fragmentary information that they think we have, they have the earliest hominin uh, fossil from Chad at six to seven million years ago. Okay, this is one candidate anyway, because it seems to sort of fulfill the two criteria that I outlined earlier. Second candidate is this Aurorin Teganensis from Kenya again. Don't, don't worry about the, the names. But this femur, in my view, belongs to an upright walking individual. So this is a second candidate. It's dated to six million years. But the dentition or the teeth are very primitive and ape-like. So how do we reconcile? Did we have bipedal locomotion before achieving the type of social structure that is more human-like? Maybe. Anyway, this is the second candidate. And then the third candidate comes from Ethiopia, and it's called Ardipithecus. Again, this researcher thinks that the foramen magnum, if you can see it here, which is supposed to be this one, is more anteriorly placed. I think this is not convincing, but they have some convincing elements from this, bow, this toe bone, which shows that the individual was upright working individual. But also, because this, if you look at this one, you have a honing complex in apes, but there is a slight hint here. So they say that it's moved a little bit away from the chimps, and they say it's expected because this is the very first starting point for the species to be a hominin. So I'm showing you these examples to basically show you how we do, how we do the determination of a hominin or not, but at the same time to show you how fragmentary the data that we have are. Anyway, three candidates to be our ancestors at the very first stage of our divergence from the apes. But by about 4.0 million years, you have the emergence of the genus Australopithecus. Clearly, bi clearly bipedal, megadont, very large molars, kept by thick enamel, and bipedalism, of course, shows that they were upright walkers. Thick enamel, they were eating, feeding on more diet, which is abrasive and harder, which is different from that of, that of apes. So this morphology signals a shift in terms of locomotion, behavior, and diet. So clearly, by this time, we have hominins that are habitual bipeds. It, I don't think it's impossible to think the very first hominins were more of facultative bipeds. This were habitual bipeds and also megadont. So a shift in terms of social structure, a shift in terms of locomotion, a shift in terms of dietary adaptation clearly heralds the emergence of hominins that are habitually biped. So today we have two hypotheses for the emergence of this Australopithecus. One would go, uh, a one is more linear going from one of this than animensis uh, than afferensis and homo, the other would be more cl cl clerogenetic where you have one of this giving rise to this and then afferensis going. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is about this time period given this background. So that was a background to show you what we know about the very first hominins, but also to give you what, the, to tell you about the big questions that we are interested in, in terms of anatomy, behavior, locomotion, and culture. But of course, as a researcher, when you go to the field or your lab, you cannot carry these big questions and start doing research. You have to have specific research questions. So my research questions are addressing the time period between 4.5 million years and 2.5 million years. Why? Because that time comes subsequent to the very first emergence of hominins, but before the emergence of the genus Homo as we know it today. Why is it interesting? Because this species being halfway in between play a pivotal role, an important critical role in bridging what is here and what comes later. I don't think you can get here if you don't know what's going on here. What are the questions? Questions relate to diversity, whether we have multiple species in this interval or just a single species. What is the degree of variation within, that, within the known species that we have here and also their phylogenetic relationship, their family tree? And of course, if you have diversity, variation, and phylogeny, all that is taking place in an environmental context, in an ecological context. So reconstructing the paleoecological context is also part of my work. So when I go to the field, these are the very uh, basic questions that I would like to address based on the fossils that I discover. And using these questions, I try to answer the big issues I outlined at the beginning. To do that, I go to uh, Ethiopia every year. Uh, I do research in Kenya also. And I specifically go to a site called Dikika, which is in the northeastern part of Ethiopia. And it's part of the Afar Depression. And the Afar Depression is interesting because it's a junction point between three rift systems. The, the Red Sea rift system, the Gulf of Aden, and the main East African rift system. And even though today, if you go to these places, it's empty, dry, and barren, over three million years ago, it was covered with forests, trees, and lakes and rivers. So that condition created a favorable condition for the flourishment and survival of our ancestors. But that was not enough. Because we had lakes and rivers, that area was a depositional environment. In other words, an area where sediments, including the remains of the animals and the humans were being accumulated instead of taken away by the, uh, or decaying in the, in the open air. And then third, much recent volcanic uh, tectonic activities, because this area is a very dynamic, tectonically uh, very dynamic place, the ancient rocks that were buried three, four, five million years ago are being exposed for us to go there and find them. And this area basically becomes a paradise for paleoanthropologists like myself. So the conditions are, these three conditions, why this area is really interesting for this type of work. So, because Dikika is also surrounded by the site of Hadar, where Lucy comes from, the site of Gona, where the known, today, uh, the, the known stone tools, the earliest stone tools come from, and then the earliest Ethiopian hominins come from here. So if you combine all that, you have the uh, cradle of mankind that many people talk about. So going to the center of the cradle of mankind was really obvious when I started the project back in 1999. To go there, it's not always easy. And these are just uh, pictures that you need lots of logistics and many vehicles, you need security and then you drive in the middle of nowhere. You cannot, go, you cannot call AAA or GEICO, so you have to do everything. <laughs> and you spend over two months here in the middle of nowhere under tents. This is our dining and living, and you just make your bread. And what's amazing is how dependent we are on technology. Even though we are here, we need all this gadget every day. And of course, more importantly, you need people. 
when I started the project back in 99, I was, it was just me and four Ethiopians uh, assistants. Now we have 40 people. When I made the discovery that I will be talking shortly about, I was just the only scientist. But now we have archeologists, paleoecologists, uh, geologists, paleontologists, etc., And of course, guards, guides, and logistics. Over 40 people work in this area every year. So the Dikika Research Project was initiated uh, and is led by myself and up until today. Uh, and the idea that took me there was because there were sediments that were older than the ones exposed at Hadar, I just wanted to know what was happening before Hadar. That was the question that took me there at the beginning. And this is what you have when you get there and you have to find <laughs> the fossils here. Well, it seems empty and uh, it seems very confusing, but when you look here, for example, this is a volcanic ash, which is dated to 3.4 million years. So if you're above, you're younger. If you're below, you're older. But of course, when you do the details of the taphonomic and other geological studies, you have a very good idea of uh, what's going on. And when you start to walk on the sites, actually, where you have nothing here, you start to find things, and uh, there is no other way, short way, you have to walk, and you start to find things. Here is the skull of an elephant, dated to over three million years. An elephant tusk just eroding out of the sand here, same age, and a monkey skull eroding out of the sand. A rhino skull coming out of the sand again even hippopotamus and crocodile eggs in that area, which is empty and barren. Well, one can ask, well, why, why do we, why do we how, can, how can the species live there? It illustrates the points I mentioned earlier. This area was drastically different in terms of environment from what you have there today. And also, when you pay close attention, you start to find things like this one. And this is actually a hippopotamus uh, phalange, a phalanx, a bone, which with the evidence of a crocodile attacking the hippo. You see that today, and this is paleoecology in action. Not only can you, do you see the evidence for the existence of the species, you also have access to the interaction, their paleoecology, in other words. So when you do the analysis of the fauna, therefore, you are able to tell this environment was like this over three million years ago. I think this is very interesting for us because understanding how the environment changes gives us a clue when we try to explain the evolutionary motors and natural uh, the selection forces that are behind the changes that we observe in terms of anatomy, locomotion, behavior in our family. But also, on the side, I think this is very important environmental lesson. Simply, you can go from here to here. So environmental change exists. So of course, when you walk on the sites every day, what you find are remains of monkeys, elephants, and rhinos, and pigs, I showed you earlier. But I am interested specifically in the human remains as a paleoanthropologist. There are three remarks to make about the remains of hominins. First of all, they are so rare that they represent less than 1% of what you find there. So you have to really look for them. And second, when you find them, you find these things. This is a premolar of a, over three million years old uh, hominin or human ancestor fossil. Even when you find something decent, if you call this decent, you have to work hard to take it from here to here. So it's really a painstaking work. Uh, it's, there is no shortcut, unfortunately. So you have to look, look, look. And when you find them, you have to go from here to here. And this is my colleague, Bill Kimball, who spent over two years doing this. Yes.
Good, thank you. Back. I'm just going to jump into my work, so it's a good break anyway. <laughs> One can wonder if early hominins had firefighters or not. <laughs> they were pretty good. <laughs> so, so this was to say that they are rare, fragmentary, and hard to find. Next. So when you find something like this, <laughs> yes, firefighters should come in now. <laughs> Saves this little child. <laughs> so, so when when this discovery was made back in 2000, uh, I was the only scientist in the field, just accompanied by two, three Ethiopians and two soldiers, actually. And what is this? This is the earliest child, three years old girl who lived and died 3.3 million years ago, and belongs to the Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis. And uh, when found first, this is the team that found her. So me, I had to take the picture, of course, these two soldiers. <laughs> so this, this is four people found, made the discovery and it was found right here. So if you remember, I told you about this volcanic ash dated to 3.4 million years ago. Finding it here was already, I already knew it was close to 3.4 million years old. So knowing the geology, someone was asking me outside, the geology is critical. Yes, it's critical. Knowing this, the age of this volcanic ash already gave me an idea of what the significance of this find would be right on the spot. And this is how it looked. And if you see here, this is actually the torso the, in the back of the, 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 the back. What you have here is a twisting spinal column. So I had to basically spend six years cleaning and preparing this fossil before it was published in 2006. Once it was found right here, we had to basically spend four seasons, four years, going back to the spot to make sure that every fragment was collected. Because when you have something like this, you cannot give any chance. Uh, you cannot give a chance to chance anyway, basically. <laughs> And we were successful. In addition to what I showed you, the skull, we found the, this is the femur, the tibia, the foot, almost complete foot. These are the metatarsals, the tarsals, the distal end of the tibia, the fibula, and this is the calcaneus, uh, basically the uh, heel bone. And also uh, part of the forehead, a still articulated tibia and femur, distal end of the humerus, which is the elbow bone, etc. So when you put everything together, you have over 60% complete child skeleton, which is more complete even the famous Lucy, which is 40% complete. But in addition, you have the face here, which was missing, unfortunately, in Lucy. And everything comes from the same individual. First of all, it was collected from a small site, a very small area. I, I asked my colleagues to show you what comes where from, and he's telling you the head came from there, he's telling you the knee came from there. <laughs> so they're they basically <laughs> pointing to. And also, we know that the problem I showed you earlier was that they are so fragmentary, the challenge is to, to, to put them together. The challenge I had was the other way around. It was everything was basically squashed uh, against the base of the skull, I had to separate it. So the images I showed you earlier were covered, but you see, you can see a nicely preserved spinal column here, and here are the ribs and the clavicles and the scapula, etc. And also, the degree of development comes from a, a young individual. As you can see, the tibia is not completely fused here. So all that uh, is uh, telling us that it's a juvenile individual and the same individual also. Comes, everything comes from the same individual because we don't have three legs, for example, or four hands. So compared to Lucy here, as I said, you have the face, but also you have parts of the lower part of the skeleton, a complete foot. And how do we know it's a hominin? Well, first of all, uh, without going to the details, many of the features here are from a bipedal creature. 
and also looking at the base of the skull clearly shows that the foramen magnum was anteriorly placed. And also, uh, if you looked at the canine, it's really very small canine, and compare it to a chimpanzee, you can see very prominent and projecting canine, and there is no forehead in apes. You have a very well formed, well, ape, uh, forehead for that species anyway, very similar to that of the tongue child, Australopithecus africanus, and the human also. So all that is to tell you that because of the vert vertical forehead, small canines, many features that are from a bipedal creature clearly puts this in a hominin or in a human ancestor. And when you look at the details of the features, it's different from the tongue child. Uh, I think we can continue. <laughs> I don't know, who decides? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, very, dif very different from Australopithecus africanus, so it belongs to the species Australopithecus afarensis. So a human ancestor belonging to the Lucy species Australopithecus afarensis coming from 3.3 .3 million years, or, uh, years ago. So all that is to tell you that we, uh, what we have here is basically the earliest child ever discovered in the history of paleoanthropology, and as you know, Children are very rare in the fossil record because they are, the bones are very fragmentary and not completely fused. So finding this was uh, really uh, very significant in the uh, field of paleoanthropology. So uh, when you have a little girl, of course, the next question is girl or boy? And how do we know whether this was a girl or a boy? Uh, first of all, this is an image of the original fossil. You have the milk teeth here, the baby teeth, basically. But when you do the CT scanning, you have both sets of the milk teeth and the still growing adult permanent dentition inside. And as you know, there is this phenomenon called sexual dimorphism in primates, that males are larger and males have larger canine. And there was this phenomenon in afarensis also, in the species which she belongs to. And when we did that, particularly the canine, and we did some analysis, it was within the low range for the species and very close to uh, confirmed individuals, female individuals of Australopithecus afarensis. So because of the small canine size, we think it's a girl. But of course, we use the adult canine tools, not the, perm the, the milk teeth, you cannot use that because it's not really dimorphic. So based on the size of the canine, we know it's a girl. And how old was she? When she died, uh, that's a bit tricky, but what we did is, uh, if you go out today uh, uh, and grab a six or seven years old child, uh, how many teeth do you think she or he will have in his mouth? Six years old, seven years old, or five? Okay, it, it will have over 40 teeth. <laughs> I have 28 and probably have the same. And why is that? Simply because at this critical age, they have both the milk teeth and the adult teeth in the mouth, as you can see it here. So this child had 40, 42 teeth in, in her mouth. Uh, see, because we don't see it, that's why we, don't, we cannot count. Otherwise, if you saw a child, uh, this is what you'd, you'd see. So what, what you do is because we know how much time would be required to accumulate this amount of teeth in apes, we did a very informed guess or estimate of about three years of age. So this individual, this girl who lived 3.3 million years ago, died when she was about three. That's how we know the age of the individual. Okay, now with all that is good information, but what does this skeleton actually tell us about the big questions I outlined at the beginning? The questions of anatomy, morphology, the questions of behavior, the questions of uh, locomotion. I will give you a few examples. First of all, when you look at the face, that's it. That is how children looked like over three million years ago. There is no speculation about that. And this documents the anatomy of the face of a child as, with, as, as it would have existed over three million years ago. 
And that's a huge addition because one key question, as I mentioned earlier, is documenting the anatomy or the morphology of the bones, one. And second, because the endocast, which is the sandstone impression of the inside of the calvaria or the skull, is well preserved, as you can see it here, we were able to measure it. In other words, we have the brain size measured. And when we did that, it was about 330 cc, which is very similar to that of a chimp. Well, it's not a surprise, because at this uh, Australopithecus afarensis is cranially primitive, but postcranially more derived species. But what was intriguing was when we did the analysis and uh, compared it to the adult value of the species. Because humans, as you know, we have big brain size, but when we're at birth, our brain is very small. That's why we need to depend on our parents so that we can get care. Otherwise, with that small brain, we cannot survive. Whereas in chimps and other animals, they can cope up with their environment faster because their brain is almost 50% formed at birth. So if you can demonstrate that the brain was growing slowly, that would be more human kind or type. If it was growing faster, it would be chimp-like. What do we see here? Well, these are the apes, these are the humans, and there is a range for this. But it is in the range for humans. Of course, at this age, there is a lot of overlap between apes and humans. But the fact that there is a little tendency to, be, to look like slightly human-like might be witnessing the emergence of childhood over three million years ago, which adds one important human attribute to the species, in my view. So based on the bones, we can talk about the behavior in addition to the morphology or anatomy I mentioned earlier. Second, what do we learn about locomotion, which is the other important question that we would like to explore? Uh, many people uh, who have worked for uh, many years, uh, including uh, Henry here, have shown clearly that Australopithecus afarensis was a bipedal species. And the many bones from the lower part of the skeleton that I showed you clearly show that they come from a bipedal creature. What was intrig intriguing, however, is the scapula or the shoulder blade was more gorilla-like, very different from that of humans and chimpanzees. And unfortunately, this is all we had from the famous Lucy. But here we have a complete scapulae, both sides, actually. So why do we have, a, and when you do the analysis, actually, here are the humans, here are the pan, and here is a gorilla, and you have the Dikika fossil, or Salam, as it was named by, it was named by the Ethiopians. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, they named her Salam to represent peace, which Salam means peace in many Ethiopian languages. So uh, Salam is the nickname of this fossil, even though many named her Lucy's baby, Lucy's child, which is a little bit uh, confusing because she lived 100,000, 150,000 years before Lucy. It would be very hard for Lucy to have this child. So, <laughs> so anyway, this is Salam or the Dikika child. So clearly gorilla-like. So, what does this mean? Well, uh, many people will tell you, different people will tell you different things. Some will say it's a primitive retention from the common ancestor. But this assumes we know the morphology of <coughs> the scapula and the common ancestor, which is not true. And the other option is that because we're looking at an increasing number of primitive features on the upper part of the skeleton, including the long and curved fingers, the morphology of the humerus, and also the scapula, in my view, it's suggesting that some arboreal behavior was happening in the species. They were climbing in trees when necessary, even though they were habitual bipeds. So this is relevant, directly relevant to the question of locomotion, which is one important issue also in the understanding of our evolutionary history. And most exciting find was actually this bone, which is the hyoid bone. It's a bone right here. It's, you can call it the tongue bone if you wish. It's a bone which supports your tongue from behind. Uh, I said, did she speak? This is uh, uh, not the right way to put the question, actually. What type of voice did she have? Because speech, 
as we all know, is not just about the morphology of your vocal cord. It has also to do something in our brain when you read about FOXP2 genes and et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that this is closer to this one and not to this one, and this is a chimp hyoid bone, might suggest that the type of voice produced by this species and by this child was more chimp-like than human-like. And you can see the analysis. These are chimps, these are uh, humans, these are, it's very ape-like. This is um, the total morphology of the hyoid bone. So it's interesting because the brain looks, uh, the brain seems to grow more humanly. The lower skeleton is human-like. The upper part of the, the, the skull is ape-like. The hyoid is ape-like. So there is a mixture of features on the skeleton. Not everything was human-like. A gorilla-like scapula, a chimp-like a hyoid bone, and very long and curved fingers. But that is very exciting because, in my view, it demonstrates that evolution is in the making and things are changing slowly and progressively, and that there was no jump from one species to the other. So this also speaks to the fact that our notion of looking at just uh, at evolution as a linear or as a line is very dangerous, and we have to really accommodate all those uh, complexities when we speak of human evolution. And also, it tells us that we are uh, like other animals subject to the forces, uh, evolutionary forces and selection forces that are out there. The result of our work was published back in 2006, uh, the cover page of Nature, and that gives you an idea of uh, its significance. But I was very surprised by the amount of mainstream media. I had to carry three false <laughs> cell phone sense, uh, cell phone, uh, three telephones anyway. And this is very interesting because it shows that the public at large is very interested in what we do and they want to know more. And in a way, it's our duty to inform them and tell them based on data and not uh, speculations. So in conclusion, I would like to just conclude by talking a little bit about the significance, uh, significance of this fossil. Well, first of all, you've heard that the term missing link for a long time. So when I was dealing with the media, many of the questions were, oh, so did you find the missing link? Did you find the missing link? <laughs> uh, the, the notion of the missing link is interesting if you're interested in linking points. And if you're not interested in really understanding the complex nature of human evolution or any animal or plant evolution, that's dangerous. The, the, the notion of missing link had some value at some point when we are trying to connect points. But now we have so much data for what we can find that we are more interested, we should be more interested in the complexity of the anatomy, the locomotion, the behavior of all these ancient species and address them, uh, address the questions in a holistic fashion. Otherwise we'll be just connecting points and those points will never connect. But indeed there was something missing in my view and that was the children were missing. <laughs> Why? Because the fossils don't preserve. Why? Because they are fragile, they are not completely fused. So the, this discovery basically fills that gap for that time period. Uh, I say this example, if you invite someone uh, from Mars to study us today and you hide all the children, he would report and say, oh, they are this tall, they are this fat, they are this thin, etc. He is or she is ignoring the, the children. In a way, that's what we are doing so far. And finding fossils like this clearly address that critical issue of missing a good chunk of a population or a species. Having said this, what are the questions that we, are, we were able to address already? Well, thanks to the face, we now have documented the morphology of children over three million years ago that have existed over three million years ago. Thanks to the many skeletal parts from the lower part of the body and then the, the gorilla-like scapula, we are able to address the question of locomotion. Thanks to the brain, well-preserved brain uh, endocast, as well as the hyoid bone, we can talk a little bit about the behavior of the species. And voice, of course, thanks to the voice, to the hyoid bone. And 
the many fossil remains, non-human fossil remains, help us address the question of paleoenvironment and paleoecology because it's critical to understand how the environment changes if we want to explain why things are changing in the first place. But the future is also more exciting because even though I spent more than six years cleaning, preparing uh, the fossil, it's not finished yet. Actually, I had to hire someone even to help me. It's painstaking, there is no shortcut. You have to go grain by grain and remove the, the fossils. And this juvenile fossils are so fragile that you would just break them if you rush them. Anyway, when that is done, we will have a very good understanding of body proportion in early hominin children, how long the arm was compared to the uh, legs, etc. And that is uh, a very important information. And change, change during ontogenetic development. As you all know, we don't look like the way we looked when we were three, for the best or for the worst. So things change, and we are not the result of evolutionary uh, changes in time, but we are also the result of the changes that occur as we grow, and addressing those issues will be very important. And also, uh, for the first time, we will be able to talk about body plants in early hominin and stature, how high they stood and what was the body plan of this ancient species when they were kids. And of course, detailed analysis of the dental morphology inside will give us uh, for the first time to look at how uh, life history was uh, taking place in this ancient uh, species. So the past is good and the future is promising. And of course, I do this along with uh, my current field work and we are keeping, uh, we keep finding things, uh, and then uh, we will see what, what's, what will come up. But as I said, we continue to prepare and clean the fossil, and I just came back from Ethiopia where I was undertaking the cleaning and preparation of the fossil uh, with the help of now a Kenyan uh, expert, and for the first time after 3.3 million years, we have opened the mouth of the child, oh. and, and we have access now to the inside of the mouth that would be useful to determine the type of diet, whether uh, about the winning time of the species, uh, what type of diet they ate, and all sorts of questions that you can address by examining the occlusal surface of the dentition. So uh, with that, uh, I thank everybody for your patience, despite the minor uh, difficulties that we had, and I would have be happy. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, sir. Uh, this is a really impressive, uh, very complete skull. Now, the, what you learn from the jawbone, because the jawbone is uh, supposed to affect the, how the brain will grow you know, later. So uh, how do you, how you see this jawbone compared with uh, chimps and humans? The jawbone, uh, if it's the maxilla, uh, even the upper jaw, right? No, uh, here. Oh, the, TM, the TMJ, the, yeah. okay. Uh, well, it's, it's it, it, based on this uh, individual, it would be very hard to uh, talk about that morphology because it's best to address those issues based on adult individuals. Uh, what this helps us, do is we can compare that morphology with adults and see how within that species, within that individual, that morphology was changing. But when you look at the adult versions of this uh, species, and we have uh, a few of them, uh, it's rather primitive, it's uh, gorilla-like. And again, that's part of the overall morphology of Australopithecus afarensis, which is rather ape-like when you look at the skull. So uh, it would be overall chimp-like. Uh, it's rather flat. It doesn't have the deep uh, mandibular fossa, which is the, bone, the, the part of the skull that interlocks with the condyle or the upper part of the jaw. Yes, sir. I can ask you about paleontological questions, but I'm curious. <laughs> we both come from Ethiopia, and there are very serious religious leaders 
So when you were in the news, did you ever get any questions from the religious leaders about your finds? <laughs> well, you know as much as I do how nationalistic Ethiopians are. So <laughs> when you tell them it was a cradle of mankind, they don't care. They like it and they love it. So <laughs> because they have a very, very, well, I should say, we have very long history. Uh, in thousands. So when they ask me questions like this, what I tell them is I'm just extending the 3,000 to 3 million. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on, on the other side, however, uh, it's interesting to see that I have more challenges in the US than in Ethiopia. And I don't know why. It's maybe because people read more about these things and then they compare them with their beliefs. Uh, and maybe it's uh, back home, you know, they take things separately. I cannot explain. Uh, I think Europe is best in this regard. <laughs> and I've lived in Africa and Europe and in the US and comparing Europe seems to be uh, uh, very good. Uh, but when I discuss with my, uh, well at home with my families, uh, they ask me this very questions. Uh, and my answer is, uh, very simple. If I take you to the museum and I showed you what I have found, uh, I will tell you this is somewhere in between a chimpanzee and a human. And I can show you the features. If you accept it, okay, but I'm not going into the details of who did it and how it happened, etc. So uh, there is a, a fine line to cross there and uh, 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 I just respect their opinions when they push uh, a little bit further, so. Yes, ma'am. I was very interested in your estimate of hominin proportions in the total yes. fossil yes. fauna yes. there. Could you tell us more about what were the most abundant animals? Oh. You mentioned the hippos and the crocodiles, but there must have been antelope. And yes, and her animals. question is, when we go to the sites, as I mentioned, the hominin remains are less than 1%. Actually, some, someone demonstrated last time at the, at the meeting, so it's even less than 0.6%. So she's asking, what are the most common uh, animals? The most common in, any, in most East African sites, similar sites, are the bovids, antelopes, 60% sometimes. Next, more common are the pigs, so suidae, suids. And next come the, uh, I think, now I'm going to be guessing a little bit. So uh, horses, day. and next would be uh, 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 oh oh I, I forgot I, hippos come before before the uh, hippos come after the pigs actually, uh, and the problem of course is hippos are so heavy we don't collect everything. So when you go back to to Addis, uh, when you do the proportion, unless you are very specifically collecting specific elements, you cannot really do the, the proportional studies. So anyway, bovids, uh, uh, pigs, hippos, monkeys, giraffes, uh, horses, and then it goes down all the way to carnivores and then uh, hominins. It would be a reflection of what you would have in any African game park uh, today. Actually, my best analog is when I go to these places, uh, uh, I hate to say I go there to, homi uh, to hand hominin for hominins. It's not true. It's like going to uh, an extinct game park that has existed at some point, but the evidence is preserved in the sedimentary archives. That would be the best way to characterize it. Yes, ma'am. Can you clarify again how tall was your... Um, hominin compared to Lucy? Lucy was 1.2 uh, meters high. I think it, in inch, uh, it's, uh, somebody can help. Uh, We're scientists, it's yes. okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> four feet, about four feet, so 1.2 met, uh, meters. And uh, this, of course, we don't know. That is one of the questions. Uh, that I would like to address in the question in the future is to put the bones in anatomical position until you do that It would be uh, very hard to determine of course you can do some extrapolations But that you need a complete femur or a complete humerus for example, so I would say uh, 
I don't know, maybe 50 centimeters, but that's just my guess. Uh, it's nothing that I can publish. Uh, Henry, do you have an opinion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this is three and a half feet is what we can go on. Three and a half feet for Lucy. Uh -huh. Okay. So Lucy is three and a half to four feet. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, no, how, how she, she died. Yeah, uh, how she died. Uh, the, the, the scientific answer would be, I don't know. Uh, but based on the circumstantial evidence that we have, we can say the following. First of all, there are no carnivore activities, indications of carnivore or scavenger activities on the bones. They are preserved and they're neat, one. Second, there is no evidence for abrasion on the bones. So that means after days or before days, she has not been transport, transported over a long distance. And also, she was deposited in a env sedimentary environment called as delta. It's a place where the river comes and then discharges its, its contents into the lake. So given all that, because there is no carnivore activity, scavenger activity, the bones are in a good shape, and there is no indication of any paleopathology, uh, any specific disease. So uh, the best guess would be that while she was maybe playing by the river, the flood took her away and then buried her right away. Because it's very clear that she was preserved in the delta when the flesh and the ligaments and everything goes there. Otherwise, you wouldn't find bones as intact as that one. So that would be my best uh, informed guess, I should say. Now that you're in the United States, where an awful lot of us think that humans were specially created, that in <laughs> fact your specimen is absolutely crucial as a missing link. Because when you get organisms that are a mixture of especially chimpanzees and hominins, um, let alone among the hominins themselves, which are more difficult to see, it becomes a bit more difficult to argue special creation. And so scientifically, this missing link might be terribly old fashioned. But in the culture of America, I mean, to me, it seems that it's actually really, really important specimen. And a bit like Artipithecus, which is, I understand it very obviously, a mixture of characteristics of chimpanzees and hominids. Yes. Now, the problem with, the, with that notion is. If it was to teach people, it's good. But if people start to incorporate that non-scientific notion into their actual work, it will eventually affect the results of our work. So the way we explain to the public is one thing. Uh, but the way we do our own research when we are in our offices should be different. So I am afraid that this notion of missing link is affecting people to be obliged to be in a position of linking points, and that's dangerous in my view. So I agree totally with you. It's much easier for the public lecture to just tell them where well, this is a missing link because this is a species which is halfway between chimps and humans, uh, well, between the common ancestor and uh, homo sapiens, so you can say this is a missing link. But uh, the danger is what I just said. Uh, scientists are, when they sit in their offices, they are sometimes using it. It's, it's sad to say. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Is there, are there any other group in Addis or studying the other, the evolution that is taking place in the other animal groups that you find? Yes. Uh, actually, even in my picture, uh, I had an archaeologist, a paleontologist, a paleoecologist. Uh, so basically, people specialize on horses, on uh, bovids on uh, monkeys, um, birds, carnivores. So when we go to the field, we have uh, uh, people composed of different areas, from different areas, areas of expertise. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to tell you all the stories, uh, which, which gives me the opportunity. Actually, this work is a real multidisciplinary project in which all those people are involved, and I should be also grateful to them. So yes, there are people who are trained to uh, study animal bones. For example, uh, Teresa Steele here, she specializes on animal bones. So are there, uh, could you just comment any evolutionary change people have found in the other apes? 
I, I really thank you for asking this question because they actually show more dramatic changes in their evolutionary history than humans are. First of all, because as opposed to 1%, we have over, say, 60% or 20% of the faunal composition, say, for pigs or suidae, you can really talk about real evolution there, where the species are changing. Just to give you an example, there is a, a species called Noto, uh, genus called Notocarus. And that Notocarus, in one part of uh, Ethiopia, it's called in the, the lower valley, in the, in the lower Omo, it changes from Notocarus uh, species A to species B to species C to species D, four species represented in four million years. And if you looked at the rodents, the micro mammals, you, the evolution is even dramatic. Of course, why? Because they have a shorter uh, generation uh, change, so they go faster. So yes, um, uh, unfortunately, they don't make it to the media, but they evolve much faster than we do, actually. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I was kind of curious, since um, your find is, is similar, at least in terms of the age of death, as the tongues of the uh, child. Um, and you have now have adults and sub-adults of both species. What <coughs> kinds of comparisons do you think um, you could make and what kinds of expectations would you have in making those comparisons yeah. of the juveniles between the two species yeah. versus the juveniles versus the adults within the species? Well, that, that's an excellent question, of course. Actually, it's in my to-do list. If you remember the ontogenetic changes, when, when I, what, what I tried to point out there is we would compare Afrancis juveniles here with Afrancis adults, tongue, and with tongue adults. This has to be done in a much more detailed fashion. But so far, what is exciting was that even at this age, tongue was different from Salam or the Dikika child. And the features I can tell you, for example, the typical anterior pillar that is characteristic of Australopithecus africanus is absent in adult Afrancis and in the snow fossil. Second, the border of the nasal bones, which is very sharp in Lucy and in, uh, not Lucy doesn't have that part, but in Afrancis other individuals in this new find, it's rather blunt, both in adults and juveniles of the tongue child. Also, if you look at the nasal bones, they are broad and short in Africanus, both in tongue and adults, whereas in this they are short and long, uh, long and narrow. So I can list all those features, uh, but these are really preliminary. But once that is finished, uh, I think they will give us a very good picture of how things are changing ont ontogenetically. Of course, that would help us explore the evolutionary mechanisms that are behind all those transformations. Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I'm wondering if a child being three years old, and I don't know that much about sort of the life history of a juvenile chimpanzee, but with a three-year-old child, if there's the potential to, to have a, come up with ideas about the age at which they learn to walk, and or even the process of, I, I mean, I understand it's speculative, but you're you're sort of right at that age where you know there may be information like that as well. In terms What's of the process. second second part? Um, so to walk in the process of the process of learning to walk in. Mm -hmm early hominids? Um, when you look at these bones uh, from a three years old child, it seems that the lower part of the skeleton is already established for bipedal locomotion. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Tim and I are planning uh, on working on the, the femur to really see if it differed significantly from that of adults that way we can tell whether the, the, the observations, so the differences are epigenetic or uh, changes that are real, uh, that are uh, inherited from uh, the common ancestor. So uh, at this stage, I really didn't have time to sit down and look at these uh, features, but the short answer would be most of the morphology on the foot, the femur, the tibia, are very uh, well adapted to bipedal locomotion. But detailed work is definitely required to, 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 to see at what age were they were learning. Also, another uh, important piece of evidence should come from finding individuals that are, individuals that are slightly younger and older. 
because now we have just two points, a three years old and an adult. And that, uh, we'll, we will see what Tim will do on that. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>